Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Logistics Executive TV. It's Kim Winter, your host. And uh, we're here with a gentleman who's an industry insider across the entire ecosystem of uh, air cargo and air freight worldwide. He's an air cargo executive uh, consultant, uh, air cargo management and uh, aircraft deployment specialist, uh, and uh, he's right into optimization of uh, of everything to do with air cargo and air freight. Roy Linkner from Atlanta. Roy, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, Kim. Good afternoon to you. Good to see you. And uh, yeah, we've been in contact for some time now, and I, it, there's been so much going on, Roy, across the entire air freight, air cargo world, um, not only just right now with the dynamics that are occurring, but also the last couple of years has been particularly interesting. Um, what I wanted to talk to you today about is, is what some of the, the biggest issues are that we see. We'll talk a little bit about recent history, but what's going on currently in the industry right now from your perspective? I mean, you're in connection with many of the major players globally. You have an in-depth, many, many decade knowledge of uh, of various companies and various forces at play in the market. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about what you see happening in the near future as well. So without further ado, perhaps you could give us a bit of a heads up on what you see as the major forces to play in the market. Um, and before we start that, maybe a little bit about your consultancy and the specialisation that you hold. Yeah, great. It's great to be with you, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, like you mentioned, I'm <clears throat> I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia, um, where it's uh, a little bit of a winter remix here today. But um, yeah, so I've I've been in air cargo for quite a few decades, and across a lot of the different you know sectors and spectrums, you know, from legacy airlines like British Airways and Delta Airlines, and then got into aircraft cargo leasing, uh, ACMI charters with Southern Air. <clears throat> and then I spent some time doing business development for the ATSG group. Um, and then most recently um, was Chief Commercial Officer of 21 Air, Miami-based uh, operator that transitioned from a scheduled charter airline to an ACMI operator. And then back in May, I was able to start my little boutique consultancy business here called Cargo Gravity. The name Cargo Gravity came from a podcast I was listening to. And uh, it, it was the gravity part of it meant that revenue is great, but what hits the bottom line is more important. So cargo gravity. So that's where that came from. And um, yeah, I've been doing this for, oh, I guess about uh, seven, eight months. And it's been fun and interesting and allowed me to see a different side of the uh, the business and put some of my expertise to use, hopefully. Very good. And you and I have crossed paths a couple of times and uh, not as far back as when I was an air freight uh, manager for Ansett Airlines uh, Air Cargo in New Zealand in 1989. But uh, you've been around that long and you've uh, you've been working with a number of clients who provide advisory services. We come back to what's what's going on now. Um, the the recent the recent past and history of the dynamics of, of what's been going on in the air cargo and air freight space in the last couple of years. It's a quick summary of that and to where where things have landed. Uh, excuse the pun. Now with issues such as capacity, um, supply, demand, what the major players are doing, and what the major forces are in the industry at the moment. Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's hard to believe that it's been three years since the beginning of the pandemic when it first started spreading. And initially, when that first happened, it was it was similar to other major disruptions that we've seen in, in other past cycles, whether it was the West Coast port strike or 9-11 or other events like that that really shook the world from a global trade perspective and transportation. And initially, it was uh, an immediate, uh, you know, suspension of flights, aircraft being handed back not just not handed back or parked, stored um, on the passenger side, but certainly at the very beginning, it was cargo as well was affected. There were defaults with contracts and <clears throat> that was very short lived, obviously, because once the once the um, PPE rush started, uh, all aircraft were deployed for cargo, particularly since the, the vast majority of the passenger long haul fleets were all suspended and parked. So we found everything flying and who would have thought it would have been two straight years of extraordinary demand for a lack of supply of capacity where, 
you know, passenger 757s with just seats in them were carrying cargo only in the belly. Yeah. Um, and those economics work for, for everybody. A lot of conversions um, as well. A lot of your passenger aircraft being converted. Yeah, the Praetors. I mean, who would have thought these Praetors would have kept flying for the, the two years until last July when some of the EASA rules kicked in and expired the exemptions they were given. Um, but here, here we are. We're coming off that huge sugar rush. And I think probably as of June, we started seeing you know cargo volumes declining. Um, but the sentiment was still very positive. I was at IOTA World Cargo Symposium in London in September. <clears throat> the enthusiasm was still very much there. Um, Tiaka had a conference in Miami in November, and it was still lukewarm. But here we are coming <clears throat> towards the end of January, and Chinese New Year's kicked in, and we're coming off that that uh, big sugar high, and uh, people are readjusting and um, you know trying to predict with a crystal ball when we'll equalize the demand and get back to a normal um, uh, you know scenario. Yeah, I think. Yeah, so. A lot of a lot of global macroeconomics playing a factor. You know, whether it's inflation, um, the, the 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 crisis and war in Russia and Ukraine, um, uh, energy prices, uh, these things are affecting things. But I think you know, air cargo has always seen a number of cycles. Um, just this has been a, a more protracted one than we've seen in the past. Sure. So, Roy, we've also seen um, a lot of the major. Uh, carriers, uh, ocean carriers, uh, for that matter, um, venturing, well, have always, most of them have always, always had an air capability, uh, whether they've owned an airline and had an aircraft contracted out or, or contracted in capacity or had some of the big dedicated um, cargo operators operating for them. But we're seeing a lot of uh, branded uh, ocean carrier operations in particular and and a lot of the major four or five uh, fr- freight forwarding organisations branding their own airlines. And that's n- not not to count in the Amazons of the world and, and others, uh, specialist um, uh, quick freight operators. Uh, what, what what do you see happening there? There's been there was a lot of talk about that last year. Um, there were a lot of aircraft being acquired um, or, or bought in and and leased into a lot of these organisations. What do you see happening there in, uh, currently and in the near future? Yeah, Kim, I see two things mainly. One is the, the the buzzword today is supply chain resiliency. That's one of the factors, and then the other one I think is really um, one stop shop and how do how do the you know, ocean lines integrate their customers, you know, needs across all modalities. Um, so as far as the disruptions that we've had, unlike any other, as far as the 30 plus years I've been in, I've never seen such a disruption for so long. All the shippers were, you know, shippers, BCOs, retailers were caught um, not expecting the bounce back in consumer demand. And large, some of that was largely driven by the stay at home uh, driving consumer products. So they felt they found themselves in a in a in a situation where they couldn't really fully benefit um, from that demand, and they they also paid a price for that disruption. So they, you know, the, the I think some of the steamship lines are responding to that cry for supply chain resiliency. And the other the other side of it, I think, is the you know the, the long term view of what they're willing to invest for that resiliency to to be able to control more of their own destiny. Both the steamship lines and the BCOs, they want to have a, a better control for it. Now, <clears throat> we're in this current dip in the market. And just as far as how long and steadfast your long-term investment perseverance will be there to not you know, detrimentally affect the investment and the return on those investments that's required. Sure. Well, that will be what's, what's left to see to play out, in my view. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks for that. I, you know, we, we, as you say, the, the industry, whether it's ocean, air, land, logistics, uh, it's cyclical. And we, we, you know, two thousand nine, two thousand eight, two thousand and nine, with the GFC, we saw, you know, cycles kick in there. The markets went down, and and then again, the same thing happened with COVID, and now the same things happening with uh, these recessionary factors that are around, affected by geopolitics, etc. In, in 
my industry uh, as a as a uh, global executive search specialist um we sort of are the budgie in the coal mine of all of this and and so that the, as soon as there's a major disruption in the market what tends to happen is you know companies tend to lay off uh, recruiting as much or they put a bit of a hold or let's not recruit or let's lay, as we're seeing in the tech sector at the, at the moment, massive layoffs. Well, are they that massive? Because most of these people were probably hired at the beginning of COVID uh, to the explosion of e-commerce, et cetera. So I think there's a bit of a softening of that blow going on. But as I say, we, we tend to see that. We saw it in 2009 in recruitment. We saw it again beginning of the pandemic. End of last year, we saw it, but all of a sudden it's lifting again. And we we seem, tend to see a two or three month lull and then a lift. And now the demand is very high. And the demand in specialist areas right throughout supply chain, including specialist areas in the cargo world, is still pretty firm. Uh, what are you seeing for the, for the companies that you're advising? Well, I think there's still a, 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 a high demand for people that can give everyone, give give people different perspectives. Um, so there's, you know, on the employment side for some of the, you know, carriers, there's been some movement, but largely I think a lot of people st stay in their lane and they haven't experienced other channels and to be able to, to have a broader perspective. My background happens to be, you know, 30 plus years where 15 of that's been on the legacy airline side and the other 15 has been been on the supply side of providing aircraft. So I can take what I've learned the first 15 years and apply it to what I'm doing the next 15 years. And that's been broadened out across the cargo ecosystem where I'm doing, you know, every, everyone's, everyone is always looking for something that can help them develop business and be a general sales agent for them or turn a Rolodex and, 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 and bring business. Um, there's yeah. other aspects to the, you know, the consultancy than, than just being a GSA. Sure. And I think, what we see also is, is, you know, people talk about the global situation. Well, we know that the global situation is a, is a is a conglomerate of a consolidation of a whole range of regional, especially in if you're talking about uh, ocean or, or air in this case, capacity. It's about what's going on regional. I mean, for God's sake, look what's happening in China at the moment with the Lunar New Year, but also the the loosening of the uh, COVID restrictions in China. Um, there are billions of people moving around. There are hundreds of millions of people wanting to fly for the first time in three years. So we're seeing that that effect of a lot of uh, air capacity coming in on the passenger airlines, I guess, uh, out of China onto various sectors into the US and other major uh, trade lanes, just simply because of the uh, geopolitics of what's happening in uh, China at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was just watching Squawk Box where Boeing CEO David Calhoun was talking about their year-end results. And he said, China's opening up their borders and they're having the bounce back that we had times two to three of magnitude, two to three times the the, the bounce back of demand. Um, as a number two economy in the world, we need China. We need its consumers, you know, to 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 start, you know, coming out of that lockdown that we've had years ago. And they're going to see that surge and bounce back. So mm -hmm. I'm hopeful by the second half of this year, we're going to have a better, a better environment, you know, care cargo environment. Um, no doubt, I think there's probably uh, a huge surge of new new aircraft, cargo aircraft being delivered, particularly on the conversion side. The pace of conversion deliveries is is exponentially higher than it's ever been. We're pushing 200 units per year, perhaps, where the average has been around 60 to 70, according to some reports that I've read. So that will just drive some older aircraft out of service, some less efficient aircraft. We saw that in 2008. And 2009, during the economic crisis, where we saw a lot of classic 7.4s being parked rapidly, and most of them didn't come back. So I, I suspect you'll see some some older, um, less efficient, both long haul and narrow body freighters being parked as these new uh, technology aircraft come come online to 321 and uh, 330, and uh, you know, and the new 777 conversion programs that are coming out do in about a sure. year's time. Well, that, that, that's interesting you say that. I mean, you know, that sort of segues in, I guess, to the issue of uh, that I wanted to ask you about, uh, about the whole um, 
uh, zero emissions and and the, the greening of uh, aviation, if you like. Um, what and is is that playing out in terms of the aircraft choices? I mean, I know organisations have got to pick the right aircraft to get the right capacity, the right fuel usage to make sure they can get the right uplift for the right distance, to make sure they get the right uh, margin uh, for themselves and their and their clients. Uh, what's what's happening in in terms of choice of aircraft? I mean, I see Emirates the other day uh, are running an aircraft on cooking oil or some reusable um, edible oil. Uh, <laughs> how is that playing out at the moment? Is it a big impact or is there a lot of noise about that just at this stage? Yeah, I think it's a huge narrative. It's a huge headline narrative, <clears throat> excuse me, where, where everybody, whether you're a BCO, you're an operator, <clears throat> you want to be able to check the box and say, these are our sustainability goals and efforts and initiatives to meet those goals. The new air, the newer converted aircraft, like a 321, and even the brand, you know, the production 777 that has a very low uh, emissions and very low noise footprint, um, that all helps to sustain or achieve those sustainability goals that that people are, um, you know, saying are important to them. And I think, again, this plays into the longer term view. If you're, you know, a longer term player and you want to be in it for the long haul, uh, this is an important topic for sure. And people are not just asking about aircraft sustainability and SAF fuel, which is increasing, will be increasingly available. Um, production of it is is somewhat limited now, but everyone is uh, experimenting and, 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 and seeing where it goes. But other things like vehicles, you know, electric vehicles and tugs and stuff like that, um, lightweight, you know, cargo packaging, um, biodegradable plastic wrap uh, on pallets, these are all things that are coming out as initiatives that are uh, part of that sustainability uh, efforts and goals. Well, there's certainly some uh, some what you'd have to call mega trends going on around the industry at the moment. That's for sure. I I mean, there's, there's I mean, you would know better than I the various media. There's some fantastic media uh, about five or six major global media outlets covering air cargo, air freight, the whole aviation sector every day of the week. Um, I see yesterday Amazon uh, celebrating having their own uh, liveried aircraft uh, and some folks I think you're aware of that are that are partnering with them to provide their own, uh, I think, seven threes across for, for a whole network across India. Yeah, yeah, I've read that. You know, they uh, they uh, Amazon announced that I think that it was their you know, third area of uh, operating their own capacity. So in the U.S. first, I guess in Europe, and now in India, which is a huge consumer market and unmet need there for for more B two C uh, air transportation. But that's a that's a that's a good development to see that happening. Um, it, it's happening in China. Uh, people with the likes of you know SF and um, other other folks there. So that that is. Um, the phenomenon that we saw back in late 2015 and early 16, um, that today I think accounts for 100 cargo aircraft. Uh, again, it's a long-term view, right? So yeah. um, there will be some bumps along the way in terms of balancing supply and demand, but uh, air cargo has been around since I've been involved and way before that. And I suspect it will be around a long time after this. And um, it's an important part of global trade. It's an important part of um, economies and, and social economic development, um, and look what it did for during the pandemic, just to bring uh, critical vaccines and PPE around the world. Awesome, yeah. Look, uh, fantastic insights, and I look forward to uh, to having some uh, at least two or three times a year catching up with you about what's going on in the industry and how things these things are changing, how the trends are changing, what the cycle's doing. Um, I've got two things I want to wrap up with, Roy. Uh, one is a question one of my staff asked me just before I, I headed back to my home office a couple of hours ago, and you may not know the answer, so I'm putting you on the spot on this one, mate. But uh, and, the, and the next one is a little bit of a tip that I always ask our, our guests to give our audience. So the first one was roughly, you know, a lot about airframes, you know, a lot about the carriers and uh, the dedicated cargo operators and what have you. How many cargo aircraft do you think there are in the world? Is there a big ballpark number that you could put your finger on? <laughs> <laughs> jet jet air jet cargo aircraft pro is numbering, I believe, somewhere around 2,200, 2,600 aircraft. Um, Sirium came out a report earlier this week, and and we know Boeing and, and Airbus put out their reports to say it's going to grow at X percent, uh, something like 
3,600 to 4,000 cargo aircraft in the next 20 years, um, which is great news for me. That means I can grow grow more gray hair and stay in the business. <laughs> but, Give a lot uh, more advice. Yeah, that's, hey, well, it, it surprises me. I, you know, I mean, I got to get somebody on on the ocean liners uh, next week and ask them how many ships there are around the world. Yes. Uh, but there's plenty of publications. I'm probably just not paying attention. But 2,200. That's actually a lot less than what I thought there would be. But but then of course. There's another question I'll put you on the spot with is what percentage of cargo roughly would you say is carried on passenger aircraft versus dedicated cargo airframes? Well, we get that question a lot, Kim. I mean, that's something that's depends which side of the fence you want to promote and say. Um, but I would say currently we're probably coming off of a, a higher uh, balance towards freighters than, than we were before the pandemic, which you know, the pundits always says 50, 50, 60, 40, something like this. I think what's more important is where in the world are the differences and why is that? The Trans-Pacific, for example, where we probably see the slowest recovery of passenger belly capacity will have the least effect on freighters because, because of the haul, because of the baggage, because of, you know, the distance involved, the weight just isn't there to sub and the size of the market. It's one of the, it is the biggest market in terms of air capacity requirement. Um, so you'll always see big long haul freighters on the Pacific in any environment, especially today. It's soft and it's Chinese New Lunar New Year. So this is all explainable. The second half of the year, we'll, we'll be watching very closely as China reopens and reintroduces more belly capacity. It's still carrying capacity. The passenger legacy U.S. carriers, for example, that's all they have to offer is the is the bellies. But we have new entrants in North America with freighters on the North uh, on the Pacific. Um, so I think that's, uh, I'd say today we're still, you know, 65% on freighters. Um, okay. and a lot of that, a lot of the, a lot of that discussion doesn't really include the pure integrated, uh, express operators of FedEx, UPS, DHL, SF express. That's okay. part of their model. As far as the air part is the middle mile and Amazon air, of course. Yeah. Okay, you know, and we can't forget the the UPSs and the FedExs and and those in the world that we see in the aircraft floating around uh, all the time. Uh, they're doing amazing service. Okay, quick wrap up before I ask you for a tip is just thinking out loud from what you just talked about. Next three months, I'm going to get you back in three months, wherever we are in the cycle now, with things starting to uh, starting to maybe pick up from the, from the dip that we've had. What are you seeing in the prospects for the industry, for, for air cargo, for air freight, for operators in the next three months? A couple of quick points, estimates, and I'll get you back in three months. We're going to find out where things got to. Well, there's a lot of new capacity coming on and a lot of new operators introducing some of that capacity. So it will be interesting to see how they adapt and how they adopt that new tech, you know, new capacity and how they deploy it. And uh, and how that shakes out, um, it'll be interesting to see what sort of the conversion, some of the older aircraft that might be parked. Um, but I think there'll there'll probably be some rebalancing of strategies and some rebalancing of budgets. Um, but I hope not too drastic, and I hope that we you know come out towards the end of Q two uh, in, in a in a confident uh, way uh, of seeing you know coming up back to a nice decent you know high single digit growth. Um, you know, we've always had spikes, even if it's just during the week, you had a Friday, Saturday peak and you had an empty flight on Monday. So if you just yeah. take that across a 12 month period, it, it sort of applies. But yeah. I think uh, nice, even growth of uh, six to nine percent would be good. OK, OK, well, we won't hold you to that, but we will come back to you. And, hey, look, it's a great industry. You and I have been in this industry for most most of our lives in one shape, form or another. Some fantastic people with some amazing organisations. It's an industry that's that's uh, high risk and uh, high danger and yeah, it takes a lot of expertise, a lot of professionalism to keep aircraft in the air, to keep people safe. So we put a shout out to everybody in the whole aviation sector and particularly cargo and the air freighters uh, and everybody playing in that space. Just before I let you go, Roy, um, 
always like our guests to give us a few tips for folks who who may be uh, young folks uh, watching the, our show who want to get into the aviation or the air cargo sector, air freight. Um, any tips uh, for them and also for folks who maybe are coming out of some other form of industry, maybe it's the tech, maybe they're coming out of Microsoft or uh, Amazon or, or somewhere and they want to get into the industry, what, what would your tips be as to where they should go and where they should look to get an entry into the sector? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I think find your passion. Um, and who doesn't love airplanes? Who doesn't love flying? Uh, I got to fly the Concorde five times. That's what took me to British Airways because Listen. they were one of two airlines that had the Concorde. So I was like, this is amazing. So you find your passion and have an unending uh, pursuit of curiosity and then adoption of 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 new technologies and 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 new ways of doing things more efficiently. Uh, the use of data now is incredible. We hear about AI and machine learning and, and autonomous and digitalization. I think all that's applicable and it's going to play out in the next 10 years, you know, certainly in cargo. And I can't wait to see uh, see us advance because that's some area that we we talk about too much, the digitalization, but it hasn't really moved forward in some sectors. Some people have. It'll be interesting to the, the steamship lines what, what they do. Um, but there's clearly some leaders out there um, and there's some laggards. And I'd like to see some yeah. of the laggards move forward and, you know, kind of advance digitization and, and integration. So there's a lot of organizations like uh, IATA, TIACA, um, around, around the world. You can Google anything these days. And, uh, you know, there's, there's there's new AI apps out now with uh, chat GPT. I'm sure will give everybody the answers for everything they ever wanted to know about how to enter this industry or anything else. But, uh, hey, uh, absolutely uh, great to talk to you again, Roy, and uh, thanks so much for your input. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Roy Linkner, um, who is the MD of Cargo Gravity uh, Industry Insider. Thanks so much again, Roy, and we look forward to catching up with you in the near future. Thanks a lot, Kim. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, on Logistics Executive TV.